<laughs> Don't forget to do that. Yes, exactly. So before I begin, I just wanted to welcome everybody and let you know that I have muted most of you. I can't jo mute Joan, so we might get some background. There is a chat button at the bottom of your screen, so you can type in questions there. At the end, there'll be time for you to either type in questions or you can just raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask Emma your questions. So I'm so glad that you've joined us tonight. So let's get started. So tonight I am here and interviewing um, and speaking with Emma Poland McLeod, who is a naturopathic doctor. Well, I guess I can't say is she almost a naturopathic doctor. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this close. This close. <laughs> and Emma grew up with um, a dad who's a pharmacist. So, oh, let's see, a download. Why am I getting a download? Yeah, I'm getting that as well. Did you get that too? Yeah. That's strange. I've never had that. Unable to download. You can still join by clicking here. How strange is that? It says it's sharing your, someone's screen. Yeah. Hmm. Options. There we go. Is that back? Yeah, back to normal. I have no idea. That's so weird. Never happened to me. Oh, well. Okay. It's the joy of being live. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so here I am with Emma. And Emma grew up with a dad who's a pharmacist. And having a dad as a pharmacist sort of sparked her interest in naturopathic medicine. And his work in alternative health inspired her to not only question things, but to dig deeper into the biochemical level of healing. Uh, Emma received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Guelph, then went on to complete her Doctor of Naturopathy at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, CCNM. Her last year at CCNM, she completed a one-year internship at the Robert Shad Naturopathic Clinic. So Emma has a special interest in women's pelvic health, including urinary and bladder issues. And she understands how vaginal and bladder issues can seriously affect the quality of a woman's life, yet it can be difficult to, to bring up to a healthcare practitioner. And sometimes there's limited treatment options as well. So welcome, Emma. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm just going to mute a couple. I'm just going to see Julie. We've got to mute Julie. Okay, I think we've got everybody else muted. There was a bit of background noise there, so then it's not as... Uh... So, and tonight we're talking about the microbiome. And I don't know about you guys that are on here tonight, but I see it everywhere. I'm hearing microbiome. Uh, during my summit, we talked about microbiome. It's in the media. It just seems to be everywhere. So, Emma, I'm going to get you to start with, can you explain what is the microbiome? Yeah, for sure. I, and I totally agree. Everywhere you look right now, it's kind of the hot topic, you know? So, it's kind of hard to go anywhere without hearing those terms, microbiome. And we throw it out there without really even understanding what it is we're talking about. And, you know, we say microbiome as one word, but actually it's, it's an ecosystem within us, right? So it's, it's an ecosystem of thousands of different species of bacteria, um, protozoa, some yeast that actually reside within our, our intestinal, right? Our gastrointestinal system. So it's, it's hard to imagine how huge it actually is. So it actually weighs about 1.5 kilograms. Wow. So yeah, so the biomass of actually all that bacteria is about like three pounds almost of our full weight is just our microbes sitting in our gut. And every day when we're excreting, like half of 50% of our fecal mass is actually coming from that gut bacteria, right? So it's huge and every day it's fluxing. So I think there's about 100,000 billion bacteria that reside within our gut. Right, and that's a within, lot. That's a yeah, lot when you think about it. Yeah, you can't even imagine it, right? And within that, 
there's about 2,000 different species that we know of. So it's extremely diverse, extremely huge numbers, and right now we're just starting to actually understand that it is implicated in our health, right? Mm -hmm. so it's kind of a general view of what it actually is. <laughs> and so let's jump into, you know, I have read and studied that actually we have more brain cells in our gut than we do in our brain. Right. So, well, what, so there's not really brain cells in the gut, but more like uh, receptors. Receptors, brain receptors, right. Right, right. right, like so the same, so receptors like serotonin is, you know, one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain. There's a huge amount of those receptors all along the gut. So there's, you know, the, ner the nervous system, which is what our brain kind of regulates. And then we think of digestive system, but there's actually the neurodigestive system that, you know, is that connection between the brain and the gut right so there is a huge connection and when we're talking about cell numbers i mean we have more the number of bacteria in our gut is more than 10 times the amount of cells in our entire body what? yeah say that again so there are 10 times more bacteria in our gut in our microbiome than there are in our entire body so it's pretty huge it's so we can't ignore it Right. No, I was going to say we can't ignore it. So explain a little bit more then about that, that, you know, you just talked on it, the connection then between the microbiome and the state of our health. How? Yeah. How is it related? What is, you know, what are we finding out now? Why are we talking about it all of a sudden? So, right. So basically just from that introduction by sheer mass, by sheer numbers and the occupancy of our gut, we can't ignore the effect that it has. So basically it has huge implications in our immune system, right? Because it's not, it's bacteria. And normally when we think of bacteria, we think of an infection, right? right. We think we have bacteria in us, we're infected with something, we need to fight it off and we're gonna be sick. But why is it that we don't have that response and we have 1.5 kilograms of bacteria in our own gut. Like it, it doesn't make sense, but it's because we grow up with this ecosystem in us. It trains ourselves and it trains our immune system how to kind of recognize what's good, what's bad, because we need each other to survive, right? So we're not attacking it. But once you start to shift the makeup of that microbiome and you start to shift the bacteria that's making it up, then we start to attack it ourselves. And that's when kind of autoimmune diseases started. That's when you start to see that in inflammatory response or um, different processes happening within the gut. And now we're seeing that other implications are attached to that as well, right? So, so yeah. Yeah, so it has huge, and so within our immune system, it's extremely, extremely important in that regulation and that inflammatory reaction. And then you get tied into food sensitivities and then, you know, that whole route too. Because I think a lot of people think, well, you know, gut bacteria, if I've got issues down there, it must be that I've got IBS or I've got an ulcer. But it's so much more than that, as you're saying, it involves the whole immune system. It can lead to autoimmune conditions. It can lead to food sensitivity. So why don't you expand a little bit mm -hmm. on all of those? Yeah, for sure. And how and that think, happens. Yeah, exactly. And, and I know sometimes we, even though you know, we haven't really been talking about the microbiome that long, we've been using antibiotics for a ton of, a ton of conditions that we don't understand why they work. So skin conditions and acne, they don't really understand why antibiotics work, but they give them out and they work, right? So it, people aren't really asking the question, but it's, it's because it's affecting your microbiome, right? So that, that's that connection. So we're kind of altering it without even thinking about it, but now we're starting to ask those questions, why? So, um, sorry, what was that? What was the specific question we were talking that you were asking about? Well, I was just going to say, let's talk about how if, well, maybe we should start with what 
affects our microbiome. So you see, we're born with a certain microbiome, and then as we, we grow and we start to experience life and eat different foods, do you want to talk about foods and how they affect? Because, you know, you're touching on antibiotics. We know antibiotics affect our microbiome, our gut flora. So let's, let's sort of just take a few and discuss how they affect our microbiome and then, yeah. and then how that results in issues. Exactly, in the issues, for sure. So well, when we talk about that, I'll talk about from the very beginning, right? Because when we're born, our immune, so our gut is actually sterile, right? We're not born with a microbiome. We're actually born with a completely sterile digestive tract. And as we emerge from the birth canal, that's when we start to populate it with those healthy bacteria, right? So the first way we affect our microbiome is actually from birth. Mm. That's how, so then we, you know, then you get into the C-section versus vaginal delivery, and then you get into the breast milk discussion and, you know, bringing in those good prebiotics, uh, to support a healthy, um, a healthy gut microbiome. So again, from birth, the way that the major implications in affecting gut health, we talked about it, antibiotics, because um, there's some research out there that I think the use of antibiotics right now is um, the statistics are that one every sing, every year one Canadian will have be on one round of antibiotics per year. That's huge. That's huge, one round per year. Yeah. So, and obviously not everyone's on them, so that means a lot of people are on multiple rounds per year. So that is an, like a complete wipeout of the microbiome. And I was gonna say, so what, you know, in these antibiotics, do they really wipe out all the bad, all the good bacteria? Yes. Yeah, so what, well, they don't kill everything, right? So there's always going to be about 10% or so that's left behind. But it alters that even. Well, what it does is it's like if you think about a stadium, right? You think about a big sports arena stadium pick, packed with like 60,000 fans, a whole bunch of diverse fans. People are all different. You know, some people cheering for the home team, some people not, that sort of thing. Um, you wipe out everyone except the first two rows. Now those first two rows have an equal opportunity to populate the stadium, right? So now you have the good and the bad, like the bad have such an easy, an easier route than when you had occupied it before with all the good. Right. You know what I mean? And then antibiotics aren't targeting yeast most of the time. So then you take out the good and the bad and now your yeast can flourish which is normally present in really small amounts, but you take out the competition and like, they're like, hey, great, look at all this room, I can just go crazy. And so when that, you think of how many kids, as you said, you know, are on an antibiotic, so each time they go on an antibiotic, even an adult, we're wiping out that good bacteria. Yeah, exactly, you're wiping it out, and now we're just understanding those correlations between you know, and like all sorts of other conditions. So antibiotics for sure. So one way we can kind of, you know, modify that is to take probiotics with our antibiotics, right? So you're not taking it at the same exact time, but you're taking it when you're on a round of antibiotics. So what you're doing basically is you're actually, you know, providing competition for that last 10% so they can't flourish when you're on the, that round. So that's actually, and, and now when we're talking you know, we're getting into the stage of antibiotic resistance, which is extremely, uh, it's a very scary and real thing that's happening and we need to have other strategies. And there is research in the use of probiotics for, you know, depleting resistance. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the whole C. difficile and all that is very, yeah, very somewhat. It's very scary. So, I mean, antibiotics is kind of like a bazooka to the, microbiome okay. basically and now we're and then diet has a huge if you look at diet different people's diets different people's microbiomes you can kind of see the different shifts and what the diet selects for right because different bacteria and microbes prefer different food sources okay so, right so if you are um a meat eater and you eat meat 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 every day every day that's going to select for a different type of bacteria than someone who's a vegetarian and isn't taking a lot of meat in their diet. So it does have a very significant effect. 
And there is some research. It's as fast as, you know, there, there's, because remember I said in the beginning too, we're excreting 50% of our fecal mass is actual biomass from the microbiome. So we're, there's a really, really high turnover rate. Okay. So if you give food to a certain type just in like two days, you can start to see those shifts really, really quickly. And they've seen that in 24 hours when they've done um, high fat, low carb versus high carb, low fat diet. Significant changes within 24 hours. Oh. So literally you can change your microbiome in a short period of time yes for sure and then you know for sustained results you do have to maintain that diet because just as fast as you change it one way it can go back right right exactly right so you if if you're just looking at those short-term fluctuations mm -hmm. so it's it's huge and processed foods and sugars feed you know those sugars um yeast have a preferential um, for taking in sugar. So again, that's a whole other aspect of it as well. So what are some other conditions that are affected or I guess connected to the health of the microbiome? Yeah, so oh, could go on. Yeah, we could go on forever. <laughs> go on over that, for sure. Well, I think when you and I were talking, you know, you mentioned migraines. Mm. I think we could talk a little bit about that, about you know, oh, yeah, weight gain, even cravings. Actually, I think you and I will maybe just do a different, a totally other Q and A about cravings. I think. Oh that, yes, that exactly. <laughs> we could. That could. Well, that goes into the whole weight gain, and so again, weight loss, weight gain. They're seeing that certain species favor weight gain and poor lipid profiles versus different species. Um, favor weight loss. So when they give not like so what they do in like mice and rat studies is they actually remove all the good bacteria. So they'll give them a really intense um, round of antibiotics, and then they'll put them put the microbiome of obese mice into them, and they'll get obese. Okay. And then they'll knock out that they'll knock out again with the antibiotics. Then they'll get the skinnier mice and get that microbiome and put it in them, and the mice will lose weight. So it's it's pretty amazing. So and that's as simple as that, that you just, yeah, you know, someone that's really, really, really trying to lose weight, it's as simple as changing your microbiome? Well, it, it, and I mean, again, it's never usually just that one thing, right, but, right. To change, but to change your microbiome, you have to change your diet. We yeah. have to start looking at, you know, hormones. We have to look at all the other aspects of your life. So in changing your microbiome, we actually end up changing a whole bunch of other things that will also help. Right. But, yeah, a lot of people... Yeah, as you say, it's, it's where your hormones are, it's what you're eating, I suppose it's your stress levels, mm -hmm. many things contribute to that microbiome. Exactly, and that's what you know we've seen a lot in the clinic at NutriChem, it's a lot of patients come in and you know they're so tired of the weight loss thing they've been to clinics they've been to experts they're not it's not even on their intake form anymore like they're like just we're not talking about weight loss i want to sleep and i want to feel better and i want to you know improve my digestion so then we do what we would normally do and then they end up losing weight and we don't even discuss weight so we put them on, you know, a 30 day gut makeover diet. So we do shift the microbiome. We give them good probiotics. We do a whole regimen on that thing. And, you know, they end up lo losing weight without counting calories, without trying. And, you know, they're like, we were told we couldn't lose weight because, you know, we're slow metabolizers or we just, it wasn't, this is just how our bone structure is. So it's pretty amazing to see these shifts, like significant weight loss. Right. Yeah. And, so, and you mentioned migraines. Maybe we'll just touch on that. So migraine yeah. headaches. Oh. If your microbiome is off or. Yeah, no, for sure. So migraine, again, bring up migraines because there was just an article in the CBC about oral um, bacteria linked to migraines. So they found a specific strain that's in the mouth. And in patients who have more migraines, they found higher amounts of this bacterial strain. So again, and then what's in the mouth, that's just, you know, the entrance way into right. the rest. Yeah, that's the beginning. That's just the beginning. So again, that just, and then that leads us into the whole pain 
the whole ah. pain and sensitivity. So there's interesting research finding in people with IBS are more sensitive um, to certain to painful stimuli, and then they're postulating that's because of their microbiome. So it's really, really interesting. And then you know, you it's there's so many things, and um, I do talk a lot about. Um, vaginal health and yeast infections, urinary tract infections, but that microbiome is huge in that area as well, right? Because you also, so you have your digestive tract that has its natural ecosystem, its microbiome, but the urinary tract also has its own flora mm -hmm. and so does the vaginal tract. So they have different species that reside in them because they're different environments, right? And those species are what protect us from pathogens. So when you know when they when you shift the microbiome, so a lot of people they go on antibiotics and then they get a yeast infection. Every time they go on antibiotics, they get a yeast infection. A lot of people always have that concern. And that's because, you know, like we were saying, you wipe out everything except those last two stands. Yeah. You have, you don't wipe out any of the yeast. So now the yeast have no competition and they completely flourish. Right. That's how important it is for us to have that good bacteria in the area to maintain, to keep that competition down. So I'm thinking people are probably saying to themselves, how do I determine the state of my microbiome? I mean, do you just gather that, well, if I've got headaches or if I've got weight gain or if I've got this, 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 and this, my microbiome must be a mess? I mean, how do we really determine Right. Health of yeah. Our yeah, exactly. That's a good question. So there's a couple ways of getting insight into the activity of our microbiome. So normally, I mean, again, we've been talking about this a couple times. People have been chronically on antibiotics and they have a lot of the key symptoms, like the allergies, eczema, asthma, that sort of atopic picture. Then it's very likely that there is a microbiome gut issue behind it. But we do, so what we do at NutriChem in our testing is you can't actually go in. We're not taking probes of the actual right. like bacteria, right? Because you can't, there's too many to see. You'd need to, you can't get that sense of how many there actually are. So what we actually do is we measure uh, metabolites of different bacteria. I don't know if you guys, my dog's barking in the background. Hello, dog. <laughs> That's not distracting. <laughs> Mine's upstairs in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, he's in the bedroom, but I can hear him. So loud. Yeah, so what we do actually at NutriCamp is we measure the metabolites that are made by certain bacteria in the gut. Right, and so these um, metabolites, we don't make them as humans, but they're made by pathogenic bacteria. So they're made by not good bacteria that we normally wouldn't want to find in a healthy person's gut. Uh -huh. So if you do find them in the urine, because we measure them through the urine, that means that there's something in your body that's producing this in a high enough amount that we can actually detect it in the urine. So we know which bacteria or which yeast makes whatever byproducts. So hipparate is more commonly made from different forms of yeast. Um, we look at tricarboxylic acid. So there's about, there's about 10 different metabolites that we're actually looking at to get an idea of, you know, the pathogenicity of the microbiome. Okay. And then, yeah, and then the next step in that is actually looking at a stool sample, right? Because the only way to kind of know what's in there is to kind of analyze what's, what's coming out. out. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't offer that with the BCB testing, but that's kind of if we're really, really stuck and things aren't shifting with what we're doing and we're, you know, then we're like, okay, there's something else possibly in here that we really need to investigate more. But usually just from the, um, that sort of testing, we can kind of deduce what we're dealing with a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and you know, I recently did the, um, body chemistry, uh, panel at NutriChem and I find it fascinating because, you know, I wrote a blog about, supplementation because again i get asked this question all the time do i need to take supplements what supplements do you take what supplements should i take is it a waste of money and 
you know, to me, it makes so much sense to figure out what's going on in your body, figure out what your levels are, mm -hmm. and then determine what you need because we're all individuals, we're all unique. So I may need a certain type of pro probiotic that's different than you. Yeah. Or I may need more B vitamins because I'm totally stressed and you're, you, you know, so to me, it really makes sense. So it was really interesting to go through that um, with you and your dad and sort of talk about it. And, and maybe, maybe you can share a little bit more about the body chemistry test and, and, you know, how it sort of came to be. I mean, your dad is so brilliant. I mean, I could listen to him for hours. Um, <laughs> in that it really does help pinpoint. And we started talking about this yesterday when I was there to find out my results about, you know, things like addictions and cravings and why we are the way we are. And as your dad said, it really always comes back to the microbiome, which is one of the tests that's in this panel now, because the more research is being done, it's leading us back to the gut, leading us back to this microbiome and how hugely important it is in how we feel, how we're going to feel. Are we going to get sick? Are we sick now? Yeah. So maybe share a little bit about how that came to be and then we're going to open it up. Let's open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, so what kind of happened in it? So there's so many different avenues in alternative healthcare that you can kind of get down these rabbit holes and start being, you know, there's the mitochondrial um, pathways and that whole energy production cycle. And then there's hormone involvement. And I mean, there's then we look at metabolism and then genetics. Now we're realizing are coming into play for a lot of, for everything, right? That's our DNA. So what, you know, when you start to go through each of these one by one with every person, it becomes like a guessing game and you have to have a million visits with people because you're like, okay, well, first we're going to look at your hormones. Is it thyroid? Is it your adrenals? Is it at, like your sex hormones? Is it, you know, what's going on with your liver? So, and then, okay, well, none of, maybe we'll give you a couple things for that. If that's not working, then you know, let's look at your genetics. Let's see, you know, what's going here or there. And then you look at the mitochondria. So there's so many different routes you can take. Instead of doing them all separately, we decided to kind of just put them all together, right? So now we have that one test, the body chemistry balancing, where we look at all the hormones. So we're basically, we're, you know, we have all the information right in front of us on our first visit. Yeah. So that's like, it's luxury for yeah. us. Huge. It's huge. It tells the story. It tells the story. And that way you're actually able to kind of look at things. And a lot of the time you can kind of look at the results and be like, tell the person probably how they're feeling before they come to the door. Because, like, oh, you probably have no energy. You're probably not able to sleep. You're deficient in D. You're, deficient. you're, you're taking in B12 because, you know, your B12 is fine, but then you're at your you know, metabolism of your B12 isn't working. So you're not taking the right form of that. And you have a blockage here or there. So it's really, it's so much information to go by that it's like amazing to have that when you're sitting for a first visit with a patient because it's your light speeds ahead already. And then being able to customize a treatment rather than kind of trying everything, you know, halfway here, there, only treating symptoms again we're getting to the root cause of what's going on right yeah so it's so it's it's amazing to have really so that's kind of how it started it started and, and the bcb itself has changed you know mm -hmm. like, yes throughout the years i mean we used to look at um we used to look at you know so what people who have registered on here are getting is the oxidative stress panel so what that is it's actually you know measuring your um how your antioxidants are able to handle that oxidative stress so that damaging capabilities of harsh harsh things in your life so how are you able to detoxify basically mm -hmm. so it's um 
So, so it's grown, it's changed. And now every time, you know, new research comes out, now we're putting more weight in the microbiome, but we've modified it to kind of make sure that we're really up to speed in all the new research. We've added in, everyone gets their vitamin D, their B12. We look at all their liver enzymes. We look at TSA. So we're looking thoroughly at the thyroid, not just thyroid itself, but, you know, T3 and T4. So things that you just can't get done. Yeah, in yeah. your normal testing, mm -hmm. which I think is very, very important because a lot of times things are missed. Yes, for and sure. And that happened with me. You know, things were missed. And, and I just don't want anyone to have to go through that, which is why I love doing these mm -hmm. sessions. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just open it up to questions, and hopefully um, we have some questions tonight. You can either type them in the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen, and I can read them. Or, I mean, a lot of you are off camera. You can come on camera, and you can sort of raise your hand and say, I have a question for Emma. <laughs> you can do it that way. Um, I mean, don't be shy. She's here. So you know what? Pick her brain. Pick her brain. Yeah. Or if you have questions for me, and, you know, I can ask her as well. I think everybody's going to be shy. I just have this funny feeling. Everybody's always so shy. <laughs> so I know there were some questions. Let me just see here that came in. So let me just check those ones too. So this was a good question. Um, what do I look for in a probiotic? Yeah, so that's a great question, right? Because we're talking all about the microbiome and that sort of thing. We need to actually look at how can we shift it through probiotics. So again, like I was saying, it is individualized and it is per condition, but generally for probiotics, um, because the amount in our gut, like what I was saying before, a hundred thousand billion, these are huge, huge amounts. So we need to actually be taking quite high doses. Okay. Right? So don't be afraid because when people look at bottles of probiotics, normally they kind of freak out because it says like 1 billion, yeah. you know, 2 billion, and people are like, what kind of a thing is this? This is insane. Nothing is 2 billion. So don't be afraid. So if you do have a concern, um, uh, like an upper GI concern, you want to be getting usually at least a 10 billion uh, dose. So if you have, if you're taking uh, antibiotics, we want you to be taking at least 30 billion. And we want to make sure that you're getting um, one that has multiple different strains. So it's a diverse one with, you know, at least four or five different strains. And, you know, you want to look for high quality, something that doesn't have a lot of like added sugar. And if you're gluten sensitive, make sure it says gluten free or lactose free, because sometimes people are taking these and they're like, oh, I don't feel so great. I'm like, did you check the label? So that's really important. So check quality, dosage, and um, diversity in strings. Okay. I'd say. Another one of the questions was, I get chronic yeast infections. Does this have to do with my microbiome? So I think you sort of touched on that, but yes, I mean. Yeah, so exa exactly. We talked about that with the antibiotic use. Uh, we talked about that kind of with uh, the shift in the microbiome as well. And again, there are, you know, there's specific strains. So lactobacillus, so the lactobacillus species are more, uh, that's kind of the dominant species in the vaginal tract. So there's a couple of specific strains that are, uh, that are shown to reduce uh, yeast infections. So taking uh, probiotics orally will actually have a significant effect on the vaginal flora. Right, so it can help to take it orally. And then there's actually also probiotic pearls or little suppositories that you can take uh, and you can insert those as well to kind of get more of a local effect. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. How do I know if I'm someone who may have a compromised microbiome? Right, so again, we talked about that a little bit. Um, and you know, usually what we tend to see, and Again, we are looking at the history. Were you the child with eczema, asthma? Did you get a lot of ear infections? That kind of like that traditional linear regression. And then you, as you age, you get all kind of weird allergies and joint pain and 
you know, we didn't really talk a lot about it, but mood and mental health has a huge, huge connection with the microbiome. So just because it's not gut related doesn't mean it's not related to your microbiome. So I think right, like recently there's a study in the uh, American Journal of Gastroenterology and they're saying that 90% of people with uh, IBS symptoms, with IBS, experience anxiety and or depression, mm -hmm. like 90%. And in, historically, they always, you know, attribute it to, oh, well, you're just having an anxious stomach or you're just complaining because your stomach hurt, but nothing, like anything else in the correlation, 90%, like they'd be like, these two are intricately related. And only now are we starting to really understand that gut brain, brain gut uh, connection. You're right, and I think so many people that experience anxiety, depression, mental health issues, it links back to the health of their microbiome. And, you know, I think of all the people that are taking drugs for depression, for anxiety, if, we, if they were to look at the microbiome and just see what's going on there, if things would change. Totally. And I get, and that's kind of brings me back to the testing because, you know, in a patient normally who would come in and their chief complaint is, um, you know, anxiety or depression, and you told them that you were going to do a test that looks at their gut, they probably think you're crazy and be like, well, I'm not paying, like, why would I do that? But because we look at it all, we find stuff and then we already can be like, look at this. There's a huge connection here. Uh -huh. they, they, and they're saying like the predictor, a huge predictor of if you're going to have any mental health condition later on in life is GI issues. So they're saying the court, like they could predict to the people that were going to have mental health conditions 12 years late, 12 years before they did based on their GI symptoms. Amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, the gut makes, you know, serotonin is one of the main neurotransmitters of the brain. 90% of the synthesis happens in the gut. Gut. Hmm. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions. So do you offer the BCB, the blood chemistry test, to people outside of your office area? And I'll let you answer, but yes. And we do have a special, NutriChem is offering a special, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do. What we do, we ship all over the world. So what we do is we would ship, so on the intake forms are all online and then we would ship you the specimen collection with the requisition and then you can go to uh, any lab in your area and then you, it has the shipping return shipping so you could send it back to us. We get all the testing done and then the, um, the intake would then be done by Skype if you're not in the area for the actual intake. Right. And if you decide to book a uh, body chemistry panel with NutriChem by the end, by the 30th of November, they're going to throw in that oxidative test, stress test that Emma talked about for free, which is great. I think it's like a $75. Yeah, usually $75 to add on. And as you say, it makes so much sense to, to know how really your body is reacting because there's good stress, bad stress, there's environmental stress, there's food stress, there's gut bacteria stress. <laughs> you want to know how your body's reacting because that's exactly. going to you and you wanna, whether you're going to get sick down the line or if you are sick. Exactly, exactly. And again, I'm always throwing it back because again, the topic is microbiome, but mm -hmm. ability to handle stress is correlated to the health of the microbiome as well. So yeah. No, so if you're flying off the handle at nothing, we got to check your microbiome. We got to check it. And that's kind of our motto is we always look at the gut. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're not talking about other things, but we always look at hormone. Like, we look at everything because yeah. you have to. It's not a one trip. It's not a one stop. It's <laughs> never one thing, right? Never one thing. Never we have one. another question. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis about seven years ago and mm -hmm. in currently in drug-induced remission, taking a biologic. Mm -hmm. I have been following an anti-inflammatory diet, gluten-free, no dairy, et cetera, for three plus years, plus take B12, omega-3, vitamin D. Any other recommendations? Okay, great. That sounds excellent, what you're doing, for sure. Yeah, good for you for going the 
anti-inflammatory diet weight. Good, good. Yeah, no, that's huge in RA. So you're doing B12, omega-3, the vitamin D. Um, again, it's kind of hard. I don't know any of your history, but if you are going the anti-inflammatory route, there is a lot of information on curcumin as a really potent uh, anti-inflammatory. If you kind of you know feel you're in that little bit of a flare-up phase, curcumin has a ton of uh, research done on inflammation, and it also does have an effect on the microbiome as well, right? Right. So that, you know, if you're looking for kind of one of the other. Um, one more thing, I'd say that curcumin is probably a, a good uh, a good thing to go in. Mm, that's a good good recommendation. Can hormonal changes such as menopause have an effect on my microbiome? <laughs> I want yeah. to know. <laughs> well, for sure. So like we said, we all, we, uh, hormones are also, so we do have, you know, experts in hormones along with microbiome at NutriChem. So we really kind of pride ourselves in being really, really on top of what's going on in those sort of phases. But there's a lot of interesting research in, um, so let, again, because I'm always looking at the kind of a that pelvic area, that's kind of my specialty. But um, so when women hit menopause, they've actually shown that as estrogen levels decline, the lactobacillus in the vaginal canal declines at the same rate. So with it's 70% of women in menopause have zero lactobacillus in their vagina. Like it's, <laughs> And so that's why most people never, who have never had UTIs in their life start getting urinary tract infections uh, when they hit menopause, right? They have no lactobacillus, the estrogen's bottomed out, now there are risks of UTI because that's your defense, right? The lactobacillus makes the area acidic, it makes the tissue nice and um, elastic, able to fight things off. When you don't have that anymore, it's super easy for pathogens to come in. So it's, you know, sometimes as simple as vaginal estrogen, giving vaginal estrogen increases significantly the lactobacillus in the area, right? So it's not like we're not even in some of these studies, they don't even give the probiotics. They're just giving the vaginal estrogen and they're watching the lactobacillus increase significantly. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge correlation as well. Hmm. Um, I don't think I've got any more questions. Let me just check the chat here. So if anybody has any questions about, you know, weight or hormones or brain health, depression, anxiety, dieting in can, relation to the gut, to the microbiome, feel free to type something up in the chat or you can put your hand up and I can unmute you. Um, Emma's here to answer your questions. And for those of you, a couple of you had just joined, um, this is being recorded. I will be sending it out so you can listen to it. Um, NutriCam very nicely is offering an added bonus if you decide to get the body chemistry balancing test. And certainly I can recommend it. It certainly has helped me. I've done it in the past. And I felt that I needed to do it again. And as Emma said, you know, they've changed some of the tests. They've tweaked them. And for me, it just makes so much sense to know what's going on in your body because it explains a lot of those symptoms. And then you can target that. You can address those as opposed to just saying, well, you know, the doctor or the naturopath said, try this, try this, try this. Um, you know, you're looking at, results from your body so to me that makes so much sense so i don't think i see any more questions are we sure there's no more questions emma is there anything else that you wanted to leave people with um, um let me think um no i think again if there's no other questions there's a lot that you can do um you know, there's so much you can do before, you, you know, we talk a lot about diet. So that's something that, you know, if you are debating, you know, getting the testing done or that sort of thing, what you can start to do today on your own is, you know, implement those kind of 
grain-free, gluten-free, dairy-free. Just, it doesn't, again, when we do these diets, it's not a long, it doesn't need to be a forever thing. People get freaked out when you tell them that, I can't eat like that forever, bye, I'm not going to do that. You know, sometimes we're just trying to induce a shift. So even we find, we usually do even the 30-day gut makeover. So you can contact us. Again, if that's kind of the route you want to go, we do have nutritionists that specifically specialize in the gut health makeover. They can work with you and get recipes until, you know, we've kind of tackled that. If you're ready to take it to the next step, then, you know, we can go forward with the BCB or you can actually just do um, naturopathic consults or pharmacist consults. You don't have to get the BCB uh, to see a clinician at NutriCam. Right. And I think a lot of people uh, work on their diet. You mean, certainly people that are in my um, forum, you know, we, I, I talk about going gluten free and dairy free and sugar free. And I think a lot of people do that. And then they feel better, but then either they fall off the wagon, or they're still got some symptoms, there's still something going on. And I think that's when you really want to look a little bit more in depth. And if you've maybe gone to a couple of doctors, and you haven't quite figured out what's going on, perhaps think about doing the BCB or, yeah. or you know, and as we mentioned earlier, you don't have to be in Ottawa. No. Uh, you can do this really anywhere. They'll send you the test. So I want to thank you, Emma, for taking time out of your evening yeah. to come and chat about gut health. Yeah. As I said, I think we could probably uh, talk about so many different things. And, you know, I invite the people here to send me an email and say, hey, I want to talk about just um, migraines and gut health, or I want to talk about just cravings. I've got, you know, I know one woman couldn't come on tonight, but she said she's going to listen to the, the, the recording. You know, she really wants to know why she cannot shake the cravings. She just has cravings, cravings, really is addicted to certain foods. And I said to her, you know, maybe Emma and I will just cover that. That's all we'll talk about. So I'm happy to do these live Q and A's for you guys. I'm here for you. I want to help you solve your health problems and obtain wellness. So let me know what you would like to hear on these Q and A. So thank you, Emma. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good night, everybody, and see you back here probably in a month's time.